If someone asks you what you know about Pablo Escobar, the first thing that comes to mind is cocaine trafficking. Then you might add that he was unfathomably rich. And last of all, one would mention his terrorist acts, political ambitions, and helping the poor. But what if I told you that all of the above could just as well be attributed to his partner and the Medellin cartel, Carlos Letter, for example? Or to another of Escobar's cartel associates, Rodriguez Gacha, who had no political ambitions. Nevertheless, it was Pablo who became a household name. And today we will try to understand what Escobar did, learning about him as the most iconic figure among the early drug lords. And we will explain who was the man who went from the poor slums of Medellin to becoming among the 10 richest people in the world, according to Forbes magazine. And why he was hunted by all of Colombia and elite US intelligence agencies and whose murder still leaves more questions than answers. Me Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria on the other side of the law. Pablo Escobar was born on December the 1st, 1949 in the small town of Titiribi near Rio Negro in the province of Antioquia. His mother, Hermilda Gaviera, was a school teacher and his father, Jesus Dari Escobar had his own ranch, which he inherited and numbered up to 800 head of cattle, mostly consisting of cows. Nevertheless, the Escobar family was not exactly living large. They stayed in a small wooden house with one room and a kitchen. And most of the time, his mother sewed clothes for the children herself to save money. But this more or less stable and settled life was disrupted by several events. First, the cows on the ranch fell ill with fever and began to die in large numbers. And the herd in a matter of days decreased by more than 500 animals, leading Jesus to declare himself bankrupt and sell the ranch. Then came the civil war between the liberals and conservatives, which historically was called La Valencia and lasted from 1948 to 1958. During that time, over 300,000 innocent people were killed and the guerrilla armies fighting in the conflict were famous for their exorbitant brutality. On one day, or rather night, this atrocity reached Titiribi. The guerrillas entered town and began dragging the inhabitants out into the street and chopping them up with machetes. The Escobar family was saved by the fact that the army had arrived in time and the guerrillas fled before they could get into the house. Yet, as they retreated, they set fire to it and the family's last possessions disappeared in the flames. The Escobars no longer had anything to hold them in Titiribi, so the entire family moved in with Pablo's grandmother, who lived in Medellin. She was in the business of bottling sauces and packing spices, which she then sold to stores and had a rather large home that could accommodate Jesus and Hermilda's entire family for a while. It's worth deviating from Pablo's story for a moment here to talk about the history of Medellin. I am sure that such small details as the family's background, the history of the city where the main character of the biography grew up, even the background of the neighborhood where he grew up, along with the mentality of the people he grew up around, are all very important in the context of a person's life story. And in the following chapters, they will help us better understand the motives behind the actions and deeds, in this case, of Pablo Escobar. Medellin is the second most populous city in Colombia, next to only Bogota, the capital of the country. It is located in the province of Antioquia and is surrounded by pine forest. It is often called the city of eternal spring, and many consider the region of its location to be the most beautiful place in South America. Under Spanish rule, the colonists favored Bogota for the most part, and even made it the capital of their Spanish captaincy general. So, the more educated and well-bred citizens flocked there, while Medellin stood somewhere on the margins and was inhabited by the rough and rude, or as they called themselves, Paisa, which means countrymen. And if the inhabitants of Bogota honored education and upbringing, the Paisas were aggressive and ambitious laborers whose main goal was to make money and become successful. And since then, the differences between the inhabitants of the capital and those of Medellin only increased. While Bogota was developing along with industry and culture, 
Medellin grew with legal activities that allowed them to become the main coffee producer in Colombia. Although criminality was also developing, mostly consisting of smuggling of various goods and selling them duty-free. So, by the time Pablo's family moved there, Medellin was rightly considered a city of smugglers. However, it is inaccurate that he started to learn this craft from a young age. Yes, he grew up in an environment in which this occupation was the norm. He even had relatives who were involved in this illegal source of income, which I will talk about a bit later. But Pablo's childhood was no different from that of other kids from poor families in Medellin. He liked to play soccer and spend the night out on the streets with his friends, doing anything that a child would think entertaining. They threw eggs at each other, taped doorbells with gum so that they would ring continuously, and generally did what we call acting naughty. Any crime was out of the question, though. At the same time, Pablo met lots of boys who would later become part of the Medellin cartel, of the most important personalities should be noted Jorge Ochoa and Gustavo Gaviria. He and Jorge had not formed a special friendship yet in those days, perhaps because of the different social statuses of their parents, or maybe because of something else. With Gustavo, who was Pablo's cousin, they had a very strong relationship, and from the moment they met, did almost all of their business together. Toward the end of high school, which, by the way, Escobar graduated from, not particularly common among boys of his social class, he got his first official job, becoming a courier for a local company involved in making dentures, which he actually delivered to dentists in Medellin on his bicycle. He gave the money he earned to his mother. Nothing indicated that the whole world would know of who this boy was later on. Escobar's first flashes of business acumen and political ambition began to appear during his university years, when he studied political science. It was then that his inner circle would hear the rhetoric he used as he tried to build a political career. In addition to starting off in politics, Pablo's abilities as a businessman began to emerge. He would buy old headstones from graves in Medellin cemeteries, where bodies had been removed because no one had visited them for a long time and then sell them to his uncle's store, where they engraved the tombstones. There are also rumors that Escobar stole them or that he was engaged in car theft and was so successful that insurance companies paid him not to steal insured cars. And of course, you've probably heard the story about the kidnapping of a rich industrialist, Diego Echevarria, whose ransom went unpaid and Pablo ended up killing him. Let's understand where these rumors came from and how much truth there is in them. After Pablo made it to Congress, in addition to accusations of drug trafficking, all sorts of stories about other illegal actions came up aimed at tarnishing Escobar's reputation. Moreover, these stories were unsupported not only by any arrest files, but even a testimony from witnesses or accomplices was not provided. And if in the case of stealing tombstones and cars, it was difficult enough to prove Escobar's guilt or innocence, then when it came to kidnapping, the whole thing might as well have been hearsay. If some of you don't know, the story here is as follows. Pablo kidnapped a wealthy businessman who was disliked by the poor folks of Medellin, and then without receiving a ransom, killed him and openly attributed the deed to himself. First off, Diego Echevera was a philanthropist who donated his money to the poor of Itagui, a town within walking distance of Medellin, and there was no hatred from the poor toward him. Secondly, this murder was also attributed to a local Medellin gang called El Mano Trejos, and I found no evidence of Pablo's connection with them. And thirdly, and most obviously, if Escobar had openly stated that he had killed a prominent Colombian citizen, he would have been hunted down by then and this would not be documented anywhere. Of course, nothing arises from nothing, and all rumors must have some basis. But let's be realistic and try to rely on facts and logical deductions, and not blindly demonize people. For instance, Hitler did not just immediately start burning Jews, but first tried to become an artist. It is the same in the case of Pablo Escobar, a boy who graduated from high school in a social environment where not everyone succeeded and then went to college, suddenly out of the blue begins to kidnap and kill people. It doesn't really sound plausible, don't you think? 
Pablo got into crime in a very different way and for very different reasons. His little business selling tombstones didn't bring in enough money for him to continue paying his tuition, so he had to leave college. Without education, Escobar could forget about a political career, and so the task of reaching the people, which was inherent in him as well as any other metal in Paisa, could be solved only through increasing his financial wealth. And here we arrive smoothly to the story of his smuggler relative. By and large, at the beginning of his adult life, Pablo stood at the crossroads of three directions from where he chose his life path. The first was a political career, which had to be postponed due to an inability to get an education and lack of financial resources. The second was a legal business or production, in other words, agriculture. Here Pablo faced the examples of his uncle, who dealt in tombstones, his grandmother, who sold spices and sauces, and his father, who had his own ranch. In the first two cases, their earnings did not match his ambitions, and in the third case, in addition to subpar earnings, he saw with his own eyes all the risks of farming as a child. The third road was smuggling. Here in front of Pablo stood the most successful of his relatives, namely his grandfather, Roberto Gaviria. He was lucky enough to find a small pot with precious stones in his vegetable garden, and without attracting much attention was able to sell them, leading him to later smuggle alcohol and tobacco and eventually allowing him to successfully provide his family with all they needed. Pablo Escobar chose the third route, and with the money he'd earned from reselling tombstones, he started smuggling tobacco. It is clear that the amount was small, and so his income was not impressive. In order to increase earnings, Pablo decided to get a job as a bodyguard to a big-time smuggler, Alvaro Prito, and through his acquaintances that already worked for Prito, arranged a meeting with him where he directly stated his intentions. Alvaro liked the straightforward young man, and he hired Escobar. Now Pablo, often being near Prito, began to absorb knowledge from the experienced smuggler like a sponge, and Prito was happy to share. When the opportunity came for a promotion, so to speak, Escobar quickly took it. Prito had a problem, though. The workers in charge of loading goods from the containers they came in into the trucks that took them to Medellin often stole, and because of this, his organization suffered losses. Escobar volunteered to solve this problem. Prito promised him 10% of the profits if the shipment made it all the way to Medellin. Pablo was well aware that the previous managers of the warehouse where the goods were located had paid the movers very little, which was why they were stealing to feed their families. When Escobar arrived, he gave the workers lunch and told them that Prito had promised him 10% of the profits for keeping the goods safe, and he would give them half if no one took anything this time. Otherwise, the conversation would be quite different, and they would have to find new jobs. This time, the shipment arrived in one piece, and Pablo kept his word to the workers. When he met with Prito after this success, he told him that he was ready to continue accompanying the cargo, to be responsible for its complete safety and, in case of failure, to liquidate the losses himself, but he wanted 50% of the profit. Prito, to put it mildly, was surprised by such a bold statement, but after a lengthy conversation, they agreed on Escobar's share of 40%, and Alvaro earned even more than before. Now, Pablo became Prito's partner and had full control of the shipment from its arrival in Panama to its delivery in Medellin. They carried somewhat legal goods like jewelry, consumer electronics, clothing, tobacco, and such. Therefore, the police did not touch Escobar for a moderate fee, and the locals did not tell anyone about his caravans, as they would also receive small gifts from Pablo. In a month, it was possible to make two such flights, and earnings from each varied between $100,000 to $120,000. And by the age of 22, Pablo Escobar became a millionaire in U.S. dollars. In this day and age, the incredible rise in wealth of a young guy like that would certainly cause a ton of questions from the state. But at that time in Colombia, no one was really following it, and Pablo was off the radar of government departments. However, a legal basis of income was still needed, and he began to invest in real estate, or rather, to be more precise, 
to engage in real estate fraud so he could launder his money. For example, he bought a house for $50,000, then sometime later sold it for the same $50,000, but on the documents declared it as $90,000, and this already laundered money went to banks or other real estate investments. Pablo kept the money in his house for a rainy day, having made a special safe for this purpose hidden in the wall. Escobar also did not forget about his family. He bought a house for his mother, in every way possible provided his closest relatives with all they needed, and took his family to America to visit Disneyland. Pablo worked in the smuggling business for a little over three years, but something happened that would greatly influence his decision to get into cocaine. Escobar paid bribes to a high-ranking policeman to allow his caravans to pass through the latter's territories uninhibited. However, the officer was transferred somewhere else where Escobar's money was no longer reaching him, and in order to at least somehow compensate for losses, he pawned Pablo to his superiors in the hopes of a promotion. Escobar's next caravan was completely confiscated. Pablo himself escaped the raid, but lost a huge amount of money. And so, as Escobar sat with his head in his hands at how much he had lost and how much effort he would have to put into restoring the routes, a man nicknamed Cucaracho, which translates to cockroach, came to him and offered him a job in cocaine. Cucaracho himself was from Chile. His previous associates had been killed by the police of the recently elected Augusto Pinochet, and now he was looking for new associates. No wonder he chose Medellin, rightly called the City of Smugglers. As for why he came to Pablo, probably only the cockroach himself could answer. Nevertheless, under the weight of his problems and the prospects of earning money that Cucaracho had painted for him, Escobar agreed to the proposal and went with his brother Gustavo to Peru to buy the first batch of cocaine paste. To bring the goods from Peru to Medellin, Pablo had to pass through three countries, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. For this purpose, he bought a Renault 4S car and hid the goods under the passenger side fender. The first trip went without incident, and one kilogram of cocaine paste worth $60 was delivered to Medellin, where a so-called kitchen was already set up to process the paste into the familiar powder we call cocaine. So ended the story of a boy from Medellin who wanted to make his way in the world and began the story of Pablo Escobar, the world-famous drug lord. Today, everyone probably knows that cocaine is a dangerous drug that is best to stay away from. Authorities in most countries keep a close eye on smugglers and severely penalize its distribution. But has it always been like this? And most importantly, what was it like when Pablo Escobar decided to start dealing? Overall, cocaine has existed for thousands of years, and South American natives chewed coca leaves long before the arrival of the Europeans. It was only at the end of the 19th century that European scientists produced the white powder we all know. At first, it was not considered to be destructive and was added to many products, the most famous being Coca-Cola. Sigmund Freud, who had used cocaine on a regular basis for years, proclaimed it to be a stimulant of sexual desire. This was one of the reasons for its widespread use in the early 20th century, and as a consequence, in 1914, the first anti-drug law was passed in the United States. Still, it continued to be officially produced, including inside the U.S. Only in 1963, at the U.N. Assembly, was coke officially listed as an outlawed substance. And as we all know from history, what is banned does not cease to exist or spread, it only sharply rises in price. And cocaine was no exception. The main center for its production until 1973 was rightly considered to be Chile. Coke was produced there and then transported to the USA. Colombians were often involved in its delivery to America. However, the batches were small, and those who bought the white powder were the so-called high society and bohemians. The market in the US was extremely small, but even then it allowed them to make a lot of money. In addition, the DEA at this time hardly looked at cocaine and did not consider it a problem. Their main headache was the importation and distribution of marijuana. As a result, by the time Pablo Escobar entered the blow business, 
the first wave of cocaine fever had already been forgotten, and authorities were not afraid of its distribution anymore, considering it an upper-class drug. Pablo himself disagreed and saw ways to expand the market in the United States. The first kilo of paste he brought from Peru and converted into powder in Colombia was sold in Colombia not to the rich, but to ordinary folks in Medellin. And Escobar noticed people coming back to him again and again to buy more. So why couldn't what worked in Colombia also work in the United States? As it turned out, it wasn't that the demand in the U.S. was low at all, but that the supply, that is, the imports, were so small that cocaine just wasn't reaching the middle or lower classes. The only thing left to do was to figure out how to import more coke into America. At first, Pablo would drive his Renault to Medellin, bringing cocaine paste to be turned into powder, and then a guy named Leo would carry the blow in a hidden pocket of his jacket to Miami and the cash back to Colombia. Pretty soon, that kind of volume just was not enough. Then Pablo hired men to transport potatoes from Peru to Colombia and paid them to carry cocaine paste along with the potatoes and a spare tire. Instead of a couple kilograms, he can now bring several dozen kilos of paste to his lab. And since Leo's jacket was not rubber, some other method of transportation was needed. To do this, Escobar bribed several pilots of small airplanes that flew between Colombia and the United States. All they had to do was bring old airplane tires full of cocaine to Miami and dump them at the airstrip. These tires would then be taken with the rest of the waste to a landfill and dumped, and Escobar's man watching the garbage truck would pick them up. In one such tire, they could place up to 40 kilos of product, and a plane could fit three to four tires. The increase in the volume of paste also created a risk of his laboratory getting detected, which was located in a residential part of Medellin, so Pablo moved it to the forest. In his first year working with cocaine, Escobar earned several times more than in his three years of smuggling. He bought himself a nice car and a house in an upscale part of Medellin. He paid the police and was sure that life was going uphill, but then something happened that actually played a huge role in Escobar's story, though at this time, no one could imagine how much it would affect his fate. A man named Gavillian worked for Pablo as a driver. He drove the potato trucks where Escobar's goods were hidden. Gavillian was not especially intelligent, and so with the money he received from his work, he immediately began buying a bunch of expensive things. As it turned out, Gavillian's uncle worked in the DAS, their version of a Department of Homeland Security, and he became very curious about from where his clueless nephew received so much money. And Gavillian thought of nothing better than to directly give up the whole scheme of his earnings. Eventually, the DAS stopped one of Pablo's trucks and told the driver to call his boss, since a bribe was needed to continue the route. Escobar received the call and took it normally, as this practice was quite common. When he arrived on the spot, Pablo was arrested and sent to prison. Escobar stayed locked up for about two months. During this time, his people ultimately found a common ground with a judge who would sit at the hearing, and acquittal was only a matter of time. But as you may have guessed by now, nothing in Escobar's story happens without the word but. The day before the hearing, a lawyer informed Pablo that the case would not be heard in Medellin, but in Pasto, the city where the truck came from. It was worsened by the fact that the verdict would be decided by a military court. They were extremely difficult to bribe, especially in a city where he had few connections. Pablo bribed the guards and escaped from prison the same night he found out. Somehow, and using a ton of money, he managed to find people who knew people that knew people who knew people who could help. Eventually, the court-martial was changed to a regular court and the judge was bought. The escape was pinned on a fake medical history and a bribe was given to the prison director. All the blame was taken by the truck driver, who received a generous compensation for it, and Escobar was completely exonerated. About a month after trial, Pablo received another setback that would affect him in the future, and if the arrest had already affected his fate, this event would sow in him the seeds of mistrust and a sense of invulnerability. The case itself went as follows. 
Two DAS agents that had previously arrested him had kidnapped Pablo and his brother Gustavo on the orders of one man. They took them to a quiet place and put them on their knees to be shot. However, their greed spoke louder than their sense of duty to the client. Escobar managed to offer more money than was promised for his death. And while Gustavo went to get the new amount, for an additional fee, Pablo also learned the name of the one who ordered them. It turned out to be none other than Cucaracho, the man who had brought Escobar into the business. It seemed to him that Pablo was taking over the business, and he wanted him out. Escobar, who was used to dealing fairly in the smuggling business, could not understand why a man who was well paid and under his protection would do this to him. But this was no longer regular smuggling. It was the cocaine business, and this case well demonstrated to Pablo the rules of the game. A short time later, he killed both the Roach and the two DAS agents who had kidnapped him. The boundaries of permissibility were expanded, and the transformation of Pablo Escobar's personality from a skillful businessman into a bloodthirsty drug lord was launched. Ahead would be the meteoric rise and golden age of the Medellin cartel, and especially of Pablo Escobar. The problems Pablo faced had left their mark on him but had no effect on his business. Moreover, everything was going exactly as Escobar had planned. The demand only continued to rise. At first, he sent one plane a week, then two and three until finally they were flying every day, bringing in $100,000 from each kilogram delivered in Miami. Taking into account that one plane could carry 120 kilos, we get a revenue of $84 million a week. And that was just the beginning. Realizing that sooner or later the scheme would be uncovered, Escobar began to think up new ways to deliver coke to the United States. And seeing how Leo time and time again smuggled goods in his magic jacket without any problems, he started to hire more people for this method of transportation. Apparently, these were no ordinary Joes off the street. They had to be known either by Pablo himself or someone from the organization had to vouch for them. These couriers, or mules as they were called, transported cocaine in a variety of ways. Some delivered it in a double-bottom suitcase. Some traveled wearing shoes with a bag of dust sewn into the sole. Others swallowed the packets and carried them in their stomachs. It even attracted the handicapped. Wheelchair users would just sit on bags of coke and the blind would carry it inside their canes. At first, the mules were flown every other day, then every day, then several times a day, until finally Pablo's organizations sent them out at every opportunity, no longer caring about being exposed. The DEA was still more worried about weed than cocaine. Meanwhile, under their noses, dozens of people were flying into the U.S. with blow every day and then flying back to Colombia with wads of cash. In one flight, a courier would get a thousand bucks in paid tickets, and Pablo Escobar would get between $100,000 and $500,000. But in addition to mules with suitcases, they would also just send suitcases full of snow to the U.S. Pablo bribed airport workers who would place luggage full of product onto the flight, and on arrival in Miami, people from the organization simply picked them up at the airport. Obviously, rumors of a 20-something-year-old guy making $84 million a week started spreading across Colombia at breakneck speed. No one before had even considered that cocaine would be in such demand in the States. For Colombians and Paisas in particular, the discovery was something of a revelation. Like Robert Henderson and George Carmack, who found gold in Alaska and led hundreds of people to go to that harsh land in hopes of getting rich at the snap of a finger, Pablo Escobar also became a discoverer, not of a gold mine, but of a large-scale, well, I would dare say industrial, cocaine-smuggling empire. Plus, with less effort than a gold mine, it bought a much larger and, most importantly, stable income. He started a real-life cocaine rush, and hundreds, if not thousands, of people all over Colombia wanted to get their piece of the drug pie. At first, it was through cash investments in Escobar's business. People brought Pablo money, and after a while, they received one and a half to two times more. 
Then more and more people started to get themselves involved in either producing cocaine or transporting it to the states. And like in anything else, some people succeeded more in this business and others less. Gradually, this disparity widened and undisputed leaders emerged that controlled the majority of the market. In Medellin, these were Carlos Letter, the Ochoa brothers, Jose Rodriguez Gacha, nicknamed the Mexican, and of course, Pablo Escobar. Very different people, all brought together by Coke. Letter was the strangest character, half Colombian, half German, a religious man who admired Hitler and read Marx, loved the Beatles, and saw cocaine as a poison that should be used to destroy American society, dreaming of one day becoming president of Colombia and even had a political party with a clear right-wing bias. The Ochoa brothers, on the other hand, were from a wealthy family and earned their money breeding horses. They were only partly involved in the coke business, but the rapid growth of Pablo's profits forced them to get fully involved, especially since cocaine transportation was not a big danger at that time, though it only increased the fortunes of its sellers. At first, the brothers' distinction was that they transported coke in the vaginas of horses, but they later abandoned this practice. Jose Rodriguez Gacha, much like Pablo and Letter, was a poor family man, who by the time of the cocaine rush had managed to accumulate a decent capital in the emerald business and became famous for his cruelty towards both competitors and partners, killing on his way all those who interfered with the increase of his wealth. This was the quartet at the top of the organization that would later be called the Medellin Cartel, but it would be wrong to say that they were the board of directors that gave the orders. They were leaders of individual organizations, but since the demand in the U.S. was literally inexhaustible, they had nothing to fight over. All the goods they sent were sold, so it was more profitable for them to help each other out. To make it clear to you what I'm saying, here are a few examples. Letter had his own island in the Bahamas, and authorities there were bought. So instead of having each group buy an island and pay off the authorities, they just used Letter's airstrip to refuel for a relatively small fee. Or, Gotcha had established routes through Mexico, and to avoid having to make a new route for everyone, they all used the Mexicans' routes, giving him a percentage of the profits. And of course, everyone used Pablo's routes, who also got a percentage of their profits. And since he was the first to enter the business, he controlled more routes, had more people and more money, and was the informal leader of this drug dealing cooperative. The smaller dealers, more often than not, were engaged in production and sent their shipments along with the cartel leader's cargoes, paying a percentage of the profits and receiving some sort of insurance that in case of seizure or loss of cargo, they would be reimbursed for their losses. The turning point that finally united the Medellin cartel was the kidnapping of the Ochoa brother's sister, Marta. It happened in 1981. By this time, each of the cartel leaders had already made a colossal amount of money, but no one yet knew what bloody measures they were willing to take since they were all just very rich sellers. And the M-19 guerrillas thought the same way. They needed money to fight the war, so they thought of nothing better than to kidnap a relative of one of the drug lords and ask him for a ransom. Who cares? They won't go to the police, and the ransom money to them will be the same as chicken feed, thought the guerrillas. To give them credit, they were not wrong, as much with the first assumption as the second. No one really went to the police, and indeed, they had a bunch of money to spend. But they didn't take into account the third thing. People working in the cocaine business and even more so at the top of the hierarchy, have long been prone to violence. Where such huge sums of money are involved, betrayal is more common, and in order to stay on top and prevent the organization from sinking into anarchy, this problem had to be solved quickly and brutally. This is also how they decided to act against the guerrillas. The very day after Barta's kidnapping, Pablo gathered every last dealer and meddled together at his house. At the meeting, he said that he intended not to give in to the extortionist demands, but to unite and strike back. His proposal was adopted unanimously. He also elected to oversee the operation, which no one objected to. They called their cooperative Death to the Kidnappers. 
Immediately after the meeting, Pablo used his police contacts and bought all the information they had on M-19. Escobar's men then scoured the jungle for their camps and, with the help of the purchased police officers, started finding their homes in the city. Once the guerrillas were found, they were first tortured and then killed in the most sophisticated ways known to Colombians from the Love Island Sila War. After a few weeks, the leaders of M-19 realized that they could not win this war and Marta Ochoa was released, while the Berrios realized that together they could work much stronger than alone. This decision to consolidate was key, and by pulling their resources, they began to increase the scope of their activities faster than ever. The golden age of the metal and drug cartel was ahead. Before I talk about Pablo Escobar and the metal and cartel's golden days, I need to clarify what I mean by that. This so-called period will be present in every biography on my channel, and therefore it's better to dot all the I's, so as to not cause misunderstanding on your part. The concept of a golden age in my interpretation means the following. It is a period in the biography of a character when they reach the peak of their criminal career, and at the same time opposing forces are either absent or cannot affect the course of their criminal activity. To put it simply, when they live the way they want and no one is an obstacle, there's no one to be reckoned with. And if we go from this definition, it turns out that the golden age of Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel was not so great and took place in the period between 1981 to 1984. Yes, some might argue that before 1981, Pablo was already making at least $4 billion a year, but the numbers afterwards are several times $4 billion. Others will say that after 1984, Escobar's business continued to bring in big money. But excuse me, running from the army and intelligence services in the jungle and other countries does not fit with the concept of a golden age. So it turns out that the man named the most famous, richest, and most powerful criminal in the world fully enjoyed the peak of his influence and wealth for only three years. Okay, now let's see how Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel lived those three golden years. We'll start with the fact that cocaine production had grown so much by that time that drug dealers started to build laboratories that looked more like small cities. And that's not a figurative comparison. The workers who went to such labs had no communication with the outside world and were in the jungle all the time. Near each of these labs, in addition to the premises for producing and packaging goods, there were small residences for housing. There was a cantina, a medical station, and even an improvised school with real teachers, as often whole families with children went to work there. One such makeshift town could accommodate 100 to 200 residents working for the cartel and could produce 10 to 20 tons of cocaine per month. When the special services later raided a laboratory called Tranquinlandia and seized 14 other nearby camps, the authorities would calculate that these seized labs brought $12 billion in net income during the two years of their existence. It should be noted that there were not just 14 of them all over Colombia, but many times more. After these figures, particularly attentive viewers may reproach me and say, how is it that before Escobar earned $4 billion a year from one laboratory, and it turned out that with 14 labs, they made only $6 billion? Yet, there are no inconsistencies here. First of all, the more product he moved, the more people he had to pay. For one flight, the volume of coke in those years had to be at least 300 kilos, otherwise the organization suffered losses. And secondly, the cocaine market also lives according to the laws of supply and demand. In the beginning, Pablo received $100,000 per kilogram, but when the supply started to grow astronomically, the price began to fall. By 1981, a kilo of cocaine in Miami cost $42,000, and by the start of 1984, the cost per kilo was some $14,000. And again, someone might argue that I said earlier the demand was inexhaustible, and it really was inexhaustible. But you also have to take into account the purchasing power of different social groups. It was possible to sell blow for $100,000 to the elite, but sooner or later, the buyers from this class ran out, and in order to sell the constantly growing supply of product, it was necessary to reduce prices so that it became available first for the middle class, 
and then for the lower class, which led to a drop in price to $14,000. But falling prices were not the only problem created by increased production. Now, there were not enough spare tires in the planes or couriers to fly back and forth, so new ways had to be invented. To his credit, Escobar was extremely resourceful in this matter and managed to stick cocaine wherever it could be stuck. He would buy cheap televisions in Panama, pull out all the wires and parts, and then stuff them with powder to match the same weight he pulled out and send them by regular cargo plane to America. One such TV set would hold about 40 kilos. This method worked, and Pablo decided to build on the success. He bought large industrial power transformers, each weighing about three and a half tons, and did the same thing with them as with the TVs. Upon arrival in the US, the cocaine was removed and the transformers were sent back because they were inoperable. Unfortunately for Escobar, the next flight did not take place because the workers filling the transformers were caught red-handed. Then Pablo found another way. He transported cocaine from Colombia to Peru and loaded it onto boxes of dried fish. One of the Peruvian's main exports, after shipping it to the United States on large cargo ships, one of these voyages could carry as much as 23 tons of cocaine. But even that wasn't enough. So Escobar hired chemists. The first results of their work was the ability to change the drug's color, and Pablo began mixing it with cocoa, which was sent from Ecuador to the United States. Then the chemist learned to create liquid cocaine and started mixing it into everything from expensive Chilean wine to the cheapest beer and soft drinks that were shipped from Latin America to the US. Liquid cocaine was also used to soak items, from people's clothes to wood. And the crowning achievement of Escobar's chemist was the ability to put cocaine into plastic. So thousands of plastics or plastic products began arriving in the US mixed with cocaine which in turn could not be smelled by any DEA dog. When it arrived in the US, whether it was colored coke mixed with cocoa, liquid coke added to a drink, or combined with plastic, with the help of other chemists, it was invariably reverted to its marketable white powder form. But no matter how good and sophisticated the new methods of transportation were, the main feature always remained the airplane. Escobar had by this time abandoned the old tire scheme and decided his own fleet of aircraft would be more practical. It all started with the first small plane of the Piper Cub variety, one of those light models with a propeller in the front. And it turns out that within a few years, the fleet grew to 15 airplanes and six helicopters, the largest of which were DC-3 and DC-6 cargoes. Each of these planes could carry up to one and a half tons at a time, not counting the DC aircraft, which had an even greater capacity. Pablo did not forget about himself and bought the Learjet Airplane Company for personal flights. Escobar's flight routes were either through Panama, Jamaica, or through Later's Island in the Bahamas. Subsequently, due to problems with the previously stated transportation routes, another route to Mexico would be added. There, Pablo Escobar made an agreement with Guadalajara cartel leader Felix Gallardo. Colombians would bring cocaine to Mexico, and the Mexicans would use their own channels to transport it to the United States, receiving a set percentage for this. Pablo's favorite route at the time was through Panama. In addition to blow, Escobar also flew gold to Panama, which he bought for cheap from the local Choco Indians. In Panama, this gold was unloaded and sold at a higher price, and on the way back, the airplane carried the money from selling cocaine along with the money from selling gold. So it became a problem how to discern which product the cash on board the aircraft came from. As I said earlier, in addition to Escobar's goods, one plane could hold the products of other drug traffickers. It is clear that Pablo's cocaine took up at least 50% of the total volume at each flight, but the remaining part could be represented by two, five, or even more drug dealers. This meant that each dealer's cocaine had to be distinguished somehow from the others. For this purpose, each individual flight had its own system of ciphers that the dealers marked their goods with. The pilot who took the cargo carried along a decoder sheet, so to speak, which upon arrival was used to distribute the coke among the dealer's representatives in America. And since I'm talking about Pablo Escobar's methods of drug transportation, 
It would be a sin not to mention what is, in my opinion, the most unusual and extraordinary method, which probably even surpassed mixing Coke with plastic. And I think a lot of people have already guessed it. Yes, Escobar's submarines are not a legend, myth, or fiction. Inspired by the James Bond movie, Pablo decided that his organization should also have its own submersible fleet. And since buying a decommissioned submarine on the black market would attract too much attention, they decided to build the submarines themselves. For this purpose, a Russian engineer was hired, and after a while, the cartel had two small submarines capable of carrying up to one and a half tons of cocaine per trip each. This method was so successful that it was adopted by other cartel bosses, and the authorities learned about the drug submarines for the first time only in 2000 during a raid where they discovered a hangar in which a new submarine was being built. It was only in 2007 that one of these submarines was caught in the act of smuggling. Of course, the methods of transportation were not limited to what I've mentioned. This was just the tip of the iceberg. And it would take more than a few dozen minutes to name the full list. By the way, if you'd be interested in watching a separate video about how coke smugglers delivered and still are delivering drugs to the U.S., please write about it in the comments. For now, however, we'll move on to an equally interesting topic, namely, to who and how much did Pablo Escobar pay to turn a blind eye to his dark deeds. He had no problem hiring people to help with transportation. It didn't matter who the person was. Pablo could offer as much money as was needed. For example, managers of Colombian airports, which the loaded aircraft passed through, received $500,000 a week. Ordinary smugglers received thousands of dollars per flight, and air pilots $1,000 for every kilo they carried. But it was all chump change because the biggest bribes were paid to the authorities of the country in which Pablo either built labs or transported goods through their territories. Peru, Ecuador, Panama, Nicaragua, Jamaica, Haiti. In each of these countries, there were people ready to ensure the safety of Escobar's business. For example, in Haiti, a general received 200,000 bucks per plane that landed in Haiti. In Peru, the head of Peruvian intelligence Vladimiro Montesinos took $300 for each kilo of blow that passed through his country, which, translated into planes, equaled about 100000 at a time. Panamanian general Manuel Noriega received the most. In those years, the largest cargo of goods passed through his country, and for one flight, he could get up to $1.5 million. Plus, he was paid for turning a blind eye to Escobar's laboratories in Panama. If we average the figures here and take into account every country that each plane had to pass through a day, it turns out that each month Pablo's organization spent $90 million just on bribing the top officials of other countries. But you and I realize that there was clearly more than one flight per day, and the exact amount could only be figured by one of Escobar's accountants. But I am sure that it was many, many times more. In general, with all of Pablo Escobar's spending and income, everything gets very complicated. No one has ever calculated exactly how much Escobar made. Forbes, when including him in their list of the richest people in the world, counted $3 billion of net income per year. Another authoritative publication, Business Insider, cites figures of $420 million a week, which with some easy calculating turns into $20 billion a year. The main difficulty in these calculations is that Escobar's business throughout his life was in the shadows, and all the figures on the alleged volumes of imported cocaine were based on successful raids by the authorities on labs in the jungle or seized coke shipments during transportation to the United States. The average figure obtained through such sources, which most people use to calculate Escobar's income, is equivalent to 15 tons per day. Let us try to poke our finger up and calculate Pablo Escobar's income. We'll take the following as a starting point. 15 tons a day is the importation of the entire Medellin cartel. Pablo was estimated to take 40 to 50 percent. Let's go with a minimum and get six tons a day. Also, on a minimum scale, we'll take the cost of cocaine per kilogram according to the DEA in the period from 1981 to 1984, which is equal to $14,000. 
Multiply 6 tons by 14,000 and we get 84 million bucks a day. Subtract from that 50% for bribes, employee salaries, unforeseen losses, etc. and you get 42 million a day. We multiply all this and we get 294 million a week, 1.2 billion per month and 14.5 billion in net income per year. The sum is so impressive that it is extremely difficult to understand and visualize its scale. So let's compare. As an example, $14 billion is the GDP of a country like Montenegro. A month of work would have allowed Escobar to buy Buckingham Palace. It took him about four days to make enough money to buy Elon Musk's rocket, an hour and a half to get the money to buy a Bugatti Veyron, and only two seconds to buy a brand new iPhone. To get the same amount of money, 40 million Russians with an average salary of 25,000 rubles would have to sell all their earnings for a year without spending one ruble. It would take more than a quarter of the population of the largest country in the world just to equal Pablo Escobar's income. And what is most ironic is, it was even easier to smuggle and sell cocaine in America than to bring the money from its sale back to Colombia much less make that drug money turn into white-hot legal finances. Escobar had just as many ways of washing money as he had transporting coke. He invested his funds in various banks and companies, and where it could not be done directly, he found frontmen. He bought and resold art by famous artists like Dali and Picasso. He ran emerald scams, selling cheap stones bought in Colombia as first-class jewelry abroad to specially hired people. Even Jews in the States were involved in laundering money for Escobar. But there was so much that Jews could not launder at all. Most of the cash that came in from the U.S. was still dirty money. Pablo hid it everywhere. But the most common ways were the so-called caletas and burials. For the first method, Escobar bought houses all over Medellin and made special spaces right at the walls, which were stuffed with money and then sealed up again. These were called coletas. In these houses lived ordinary people that Pablo trusted. Often they didn't even know about the hiding places. As for the burials, I think it's obvious. The money was just buried in the ground in crates or barrels. At least once every six months, the money in such hiding places was moved to new ones. However, even that didn't help. And about 10% of all income was written off due to deterioration. I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out that Pablo spent less money on himself than he lost in the stashes. And even so, Escobar's life didn't get any worse. His business worked so well that it was much easier to earn money than to spend it all. But Pablo was just as successful. He owned at least 400 estates throughout Colombia, dozens of houses and apartments in Medellin, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of real estate in the US and Spain. He had his own soccer club and the largest zoo in Colombia. He built a separate neighborhood in Medellin for all his relatives, consisting of 40 houses. And Escobar's daily routine was like that of royalty. First-class food, a load of servants and assistants who at the first call performed everything their boss said. And Pablo did not forget traveling. He traveled with his family throughout Europe and visited Hong Kong. And in his second visit to the United States, went to the White House in Las Vegas, where, according to his brother, they met Frank Sinatra. The quintessential example of Escobar's lifestyle was his estate, called Napolis. This luxurious property was located on a plot of 11 and a half square miles with a river flowing through it. In addition to the estate, there were several other homes, an airstrip, and the biggest zoo in Colombia, which was open to visitors for free. The fields that adjoined the house were planted with fruit trees, and herds of cows grazed in the meadows. Whenever he had a free moment, Escobar liked to ride with his children and his wife between these fields in a four-horse silver carriage. In addition to the zoo, which included a variety of animals ranging from hippos, rhinos, giraffes and elephants to ostriches, emus, zebras, monkeys and kangaroos, the estate also had full-scale statues of prehistoric creatures made of concrete. But Pablo didn't just collect animals. He also had a collection of cars, where among others was the car that Bonnie and Clyde were killed in, and an old Pontiac that belonged to Al Capone. Napolis did not suffer from a lack of entertainment either. 
There was a swimming pool, a basketball court, a soccer field, and a tennis court. Pablo kept horses for horseback riding and had a whole motorcycle and car fleet to organize races. And for fun on the river, they had boats and jet skis. Inside the main house was no lack of luxury. There was another swimming pool, jacuzzi, large dining areas, and a whole movie theater. All members of the family had their own rooms with a separate bathroom and toilet. And if someone suddenly got hungry, there were always cooks in the kitchen who could prepare whatever their soul desired. Pablo even built a whole room in the house for parties, where the best artists of South America performed, and the guests consisted of politicians, business owners, artists, and other representatives of high society. Pablo Escobar felt like the king, if not of the world, then of Colombia for sure. The only thing that kept him from resting was one childhood dream. He still wanted to become president of Colombia. When one first learns that Pablo Escobar was elected to the Colombian Congress, they are not remotely surprised. After all, nowadays it is no secret what he did and how he made his fortune. In those years, people may have guessed about the origin of his money, but no one could directly link Pablo to cocaine. To the public, he was a rich businessman whose main income came from real estate deals. Escobar's confidence in his desire to get into politics was added to the fact that Colombia in those days was a very corrupt country, and he had so much money that he could negotiate with anyone. And the examples of other South American leaders that were involved in one way or another in the cocaine business hinted at the foregone success of his scheme. All that remained was to turn his dreams into a reality. Escobar decided to pave his way to the presidency, and in 1982, he entered the congressional elections as a deputy representative of the Liberal Party. The main vector of his campaign was aimed at the poor of Colombia. He positioned himself as a candidate of the people and for the people. And here it is worth emphasizing. When telling the story of Escobar, various authors often skip over this aspect of his life, mentioning in passing that he built houses for the poor and helped them in some way. In my opinion, this is extremely wrong because, due to the faulty disclosure of this topic, it's not fully understood why the poor of Medellin would continue to support him despite all the negative things he would do later on. After all, it is very strange that people would love a terrorist because of the fact that he once built free housing in a few soccer fields. The most famous acts of helping the poor in Pablo Escobar's performance, known to all who are somehow interested in him, were the construction of a residential area on the site of a former landfill and the opening of dozens of free-use soccer fields. But these were just bright flashes that sparked so high that they got noticed by the greater public. However, as we all know, true intention is not in grand gestures, but in small details and deeds. And these small deeds of Escobar were not at odds with what the majority knew of. For example, he created his own so-called welfare system. People who were out of work could go to a special office and leave a request. Once it was accepted, their expenses were taken care of by Pablo for a couple of months, and his men would start looking for jobs for them. The only condition was that the person had to work for at least a year in the place they found. Another act was that Pablo bought a large house in the center of Medellin, and every week his men brought poor people there from the outskirts so that they could get free medical care, clothes, and a small sum of money. Escobar even had a special person whose sole duty was to check if the people asking for money really had cancer, AIDS, or some other serious illness. If they were not lying, Pablo paid for their treatment. He also paid for the college education of young people who requested it. A former teacher, Pablo's mother helped him in these endeavors and traveled around the country giving money to build schools and buy necessary equipment and stationery. After floods, which are not rare in Colombia, Escobar's guys supplied the people with all the necessities and then helped with the purchase of building materials to rebuild destroyed houses. Pablo Escobar built hospitals, roads where none existed before, gave free medicine and shelter to the homeless and jobs to the unemployed, and education to those who could not afford it. For poor people, he was not just a man who built soccer fields and 400 houses. He was almost a guardian angel who did good deeds wherever he stepped. It's no wonder that later on they would forgive him for all of his terrible ones.
In the meantime, Pablo Escobar was campaigning. He had a radio show called Civil Rights Come In, where he told the whole of Colombia about his social program named Medellin Without Slums. Pablo flew airplanes over cities to drop leaflets urging people to vote for him. And his main trick was public speaking, where he literally made his listeners fall in love through his speeches. And after, Escobar's people opened suitcases with money and gave them to all in attendance. Though it was not speeches and money that made Pablo stand out among the other candidates, but his actions. If he promised something at his speech or on the radio, a few days later, his team had already started to fulfill his promise. It is therefore not surprising that Pablo Escobar was eventually elected to Congress. Escobar would stay in his role as congressman for about a year. He went to Spain for the inauguration of their prime minister, and he voted and spoke in meetings, as well as convinced Congress that in no case should they pass a law allowing extradition. But the longer Pablo remained in the public eye, and the more he took part in the political life of the country, the more Colombian intelligence agencies and the American DEA dug under him. And within the walls of Congress, talk about the dominance of drug money in politics grew louder and louder. The most vocal opponent of drug money was the Minister of Justice, Rodrigo Lara Bonilla. Escobar realized where this was going and struck first, trying to shut up the mouthpiece that would sooner or later denounce him. He accused Bonilla through another congressman, Jairo Ortega, of taking money from drug dealers himself, providing as proof a check for Lara Bonilla's Senate campaign signed by the head of the Leticia drug ring. Bonilla immediately responded and publicly accused Escobar of cocaine trafficking. On the same day, a Bogota newspaper miraculously included a case of Pablo's one and only arrest for transporting cocaine paste. Escobar, of course, denied everything and stood on the fact that it was all an impudent slander attempt. Afterward, he still responded for some time to Lara Bonilla's accusations and refused to step down from his post. But lacking support from Congress members and realizing that all these public disputes only further exposed his true business, Pablo Escobar left his post and with it, his dream of becoming president. Lara Bonilla, however, was not deterred. He denounced 30 more congressmen, decided that Escobar's planes should be stripped of their flight licenses, and tried to prove that at least six professional soccer teams depended on the money of smugglers. He was hitting the drug lords with all guns and wasn't going to stop. All of this led to hundreds of death threats against Rodrigo Lara Bonilla, and Escobar was already preparing an actual hit plan. Then again, when you first learn that Pablo ordered the assassination of the Minister of Justice, it somehow doesn't make sense. Some thug defies the whole country, preparing to assassinate a chief executive of the country? But if you trace Escobar's entire path to this assassination attempt, there's nothing surprising here. Imagine you're Pablo Escobar. You were born during a bloody civil war. See with your own eyes at a young age all the atrocities it brought. Then you move to the big city. The atrocities are left behind. You live a happy but poor childhood, graduate from high school and go to college, dreaming of a political career. But your life has not become dramatically richer, and for lack of funds, you have to drop your studies. This setback does not knock you down, and you throw all of your energy into another goal, getting rich. You choose a smuggling business, successfully enter it, and earn your first million dollars. But there's an unfortunate coincidence of circumstances and everything goes to hell, yet you immediately grab another opportunity. You start trading cocaine. This occupation begins to bring more money than smuggling. Everything goes well, but then BAM! The first betrayal. You're about to be killed. You manage to survive and you're faced with a choice. Either leave the business and hide so this man will not find you, or answer him in the same token. Being a proud and strong man, you choose the second option and kill this man. The other person then steals from you. Again, a choice. Forgive and in all likelihood others will steal too, or kill to keep order. And you kill because this business gives you money, gives you power and the life you've always dreamed of. Now, everyone knows what happens to those who betray you or lose your money. This becomes the rule within the organization. But then you are attacked by outside forces and your associate's sister is kidnapped. 
In response, you gather all your men and declare war on the enemy. You organize a massacre, killing people right on the streets, and the police, fed by you, just turn a blind eye. In the end, you win and are not punished for killing dozens of people. Then your profits skyrocket so high that you yourself stop believing what's going on. You, a poor boy from the slums, in a matter of years have gone from the ghettos of Medellin to a luxurious estate of over 7,000 acres. You're now on equal footing with rulers of nations, and poor people idolize you, almost literally, hanging icons with your image on the walls of their homes. And finally, you are one step away from the fulfillment of your main dream. You got into Congress, made it a couple of years, and you can become president of your country. But then Rodrigo Larabonilla shows up, and in full view of everyone, he pours some tar and a bag of feathers on you. Then he kicks you out of Congress, and you lose the opportunity to realize your dream forever. That's roughly how Pablo Escobar felt when the case for his arrest came up. The man who felt he was the master of Colombia had been dishonored in his eyes. With that, Laura Bonilla's fate was sealed, and on April the 30th of 1984, he was killed in his car by a gunman on a motorcycle. Perhaps if there had been no personal motive here, the murder would not have taken place. If Escobar had a cool head, he would have been able to appreciate the magnitude of the consequences. But, as Pablo's ever-increasing wealth and total impunity from any crime clouded his mind and made him feel invulnerable, and with Bonilla's accusations that led to his resignation from Congress, his ego was hit. So what happened, happened. But Pablo Escobar had made his biggest mistake. He had declared war with the only force that could keep him from the United States. The killing of Lara Bonilla could not go unnoticed. While Colombian President Betancourt had previously been highly skeptical of the idea of extradition and did not support sending his citizens off to the United States, after this incident, he reconsidered his views. On May the 1st of 1984, he issued a state of siege decree, which stated that all leaders of the Medellin cartel were to be tried by military court without bail for the entire duration of the investigation. Police were given sweeping powers to search, seize, arrest, and detain for questioning without charges. Within days, hundreds of suspects were thrown into jail. Police officers searched more than 100 properties allegedly belonging to the cartel. Airplanes, cars, trucks, and other property were seized across the country, particularly the Napolis estate owned by Pablo. Escobar was forced to flee Colombia for Panama, there he could hide under the protection of General Noriega, with whom Pablo had long-standing business connections. Of course, in Panama, Escobar did not live as luxurious a life as in Naples, but he was not poor either. Staying there was like living in a five-star hotel. Near their house was a swimming pool, gym, soccer field, and a golf course. But Escobar could not afford to have fun all day long. He had to deal with a business that was in jeopardy. On the one hand, he had began to expand his laboratories in Panama and negotiated the construction of several more in Nicaragua. On the other, he was trying to negotiate with the Betancourt government. Unofficially, of course. He and his cartel partners sent a long letter to Belisario Betancourt through an intermediary. In the first part, the authors summarized the history of the drug trade in Colombia. It claimed that their organizations control 70 to 80 percent of the total amount of cocaine produced in the country. It went on to assure that the organizations they represent were neither directly nor indirectly responsible for the murder of Lara Bonilla. Moreover, the businessmen disassociated themselves from politics. It was not in their plans to change the existing democratic and republican system in Colombia. The second part of the memorandum offered the government a deal. For their part, the Coke Kings pledged to hand over to the state all secret airfields and labs, to dissolve the cartel, and to let their money circulate in Colombia, to help plant crops besides coca and marijuana, and to cooperate with the government in campaigns to eradicate drug addiction and treat addicts in the country. In return, the Kingpins wanted Betancourt to lift the state of siege and agreed not to extradite criminals to the U.S. who had broken the law prior to this letter. 
In other words, the cartel demanded amnesty. When Betancur sent his men back with a refusal, the cartel offered in addition to pay Colombia's foreign debt, which was at the time in the order of 10 to 15 billion dollars. But under pressure from the U.S., who threatened to bring in troops if they agreed to Escobar's proposal, the president rejected the offer. Around the same time that the cartel received Betancourt's rejection, Pablo was informed that Noriega was preparing to meet with the DEA to extradite the cartel leaders in exchange for his own amnesty. Everyone immediately left Panama that day. Gacha and Letter secretly returned to Colombia, while Jorge Ochoa and Escobar headed for Nicaragua. By that time in Colombia, Pablo had been indicted on five counts, one of which could get him extradited to the U.S. While in Nicaragua, an incident occurred that finally confirmed Pablo's connection to cocaine for everyone. Escobar hired a pilot named Barry Seal to transport the goods, but he later turned out to work for U.S. intelligence. While the goods were being loaded onto the plane, photos were taken of Pablo. These photos were then shown on American TV during the president's speech. After two consecutive betrayals, Escobar decided that the only place he could keep things under control was Colombia. Even with the constant roundups and raids, it was safer there than in other countries. Once Pablo was back and settled in Medellin, he called together all the people linked to the cocaine business in one way or another so that he wouldn't have to fear a surprise police raid. All the big-time smugglers, businessmen, and even soccer team owners were there. At the meeting, he suggested that they all unite to fight extradition. The team owners were to go on strike and not play. And all those directly involved in the business were to form a union, something like their own army, which would act together and protect all drug traffickers from encroachment by the authorities. Medellin, according to his plan, was to be divided into several zones, each of which should be controlled by a specific group. Escobar's enthusiasm was not shared by everyone, and many took time to reflect. It seemed to them that since all the lights were shining on Pablo, they might not be affected. Escobar, on the other hand, didn't have time to wait for everyone to think things through. That same evening after the meeting, the house was raided by the police. Pablo managed to slip away, but it was another wake-up call. On his return from Nicaragua, he had quietly paid a high-ranking policeman to stay in town, but the raid was clearly not part of that. Now it was impossible to rely on the police on his payroll. From then on, he would only pay them for information. The permanent payments were stopped, and he, together with those who supported him, began to form their own security service, thinking out methods of transportation and toss-outs in case of unexpected raids. Since he was now wanted by every cop in Colombia, a safe way to get around Medellin had to be devised. For this purpose, several dozen cab cars were bought, in which Pablo traveled from place to place in the trunks. For surprise raids, inconspicuous hiding places were made in houses where he could hide in case he couldn't escape. And most importantly, he now needed reliable people who would be his ears and eyes and would guard his life and freedom 24-7. He had former guards kill off the people he didn't want. They were called sicarios. These were guys from poor neighborhoods in Medellin. Their family struggled to find money for food and clothing, so when Escobar's men came to them and said they were willing to pay them to do their boss's bidding, they gladly agreed. And while the Sicarios used to be a kind of cartel police that killed people who betrayed the sellers, now it was more like a private army. The whole city was divided into four parts, each of which contained so-called Sicario offices. These were bars, billiard rooms, and other places where men normally gathered. In these offices were Escobar's strike teams, which included older age boys. The younger boys served as eyes and ears. They were on the streets and reported all police movements by walkie-talkie. Escobar took the acceptance of extradition as a declaration of war and deployed his guerrilla network throughout Medellin. He openly made it clear to the authorities that he would rather die in Colombia than end up in an American prison. Having finished organizing his security system, Escobar decided to go on the offensive. His men began threatening anyone who could influence the canceling of extradition. They sent letters, made phone calls, shot at houses, and tried in every possible way through fear to get the desired decision. When these actions failed, 
Pablo decided that the best way to cancel extradition would be to destroy all the evidence against him. The challenge was that they were located nowhere else but the Colombian Palace of Justice. To do this, he contacted the leaders of the M-19 guerrillas, who, after the kidnapping of Marta Ochoa and skirmishes with the cartel, were now allies of Escobar and even helped guard his jungle laboratories. It is not known exactly how much was offered to the guerrillas, but it was enough for them to agree to take over the Palace of Justice and burn all the evidence against Escobar and the cartel. On November the 6th, from the moment the palace opened, it was filled with guerrillas disguised as ordinary visitors, and close to lunchtime, a strike team arrived and stormed the building to take it over, killing the guards. They brought with them a variety of weapons ranging from pistols to machine guns. The total number of invaders was so large that they could control every entrance and all the halls. In addition to the guerrillas, there were some 250 to 300 hostages in the palace including members of the Supreme Court. The official demand of the invaders was that the president of the nation come to the building for negotiations. Some authors claim that this demand was made in order to force Betancourt to openly discuss canceling extradition. But be that as it may, no negotiations took place. Instead, the military surrounded the building. Tanks and airplanes even went in. For the first day, the soldiers led a siege, trying to smoke out the invaders with little bloodshed. By evening, they managed to get into the building, but the guerrillas had no thought of surrendering. Instead, they set fire to the archives that contained evidence against the cartel and continued to fight the soldiers. The troops did not manage to recapture the building until afternoon the next day. About 100 people were killed in the fighting, including members of the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court. With this event, Pablo Escobar showed everyone that he would stop at nothing in his fight against extradition. And if they were not ready to peacefully accept his demands, he would force them to do so. He was well aware that war often ends with a peace agreement and went into battle, throwing forth all of his forces and resources so as to be in a more favorable position at the negotiating table in the end, to be the one who dictates the terms of the agreement. In previous chapters, I said that when you first hear that Pablo went to Congress or that he ordered Bonilla's murder, it initially seems like a movie plot, and it's not quite clear how it could have happened. Yet, when you go a little deeper into the circumstances of what occurred, everything falls into place, and the logic of what happened becomes clear. As it was with the storming of the Palace of Justice and further with a quasi-guerrilla war against the state. During the time Escobar spent in the cocaine business, Violence and murder became for him the only solution to any attacks on his organization. In order to keep an organization running that generated such huge profits and yet was outside of accepted laws, there was simply no other way. Besides, the example of the La Violencia War, which had ended not so long ago, was still well etched in the minds of the population and the existence of more than one group of guerrillas who at the same time were conducting their own military actions could not be discarded. It turns out that violence was everywhere in those days. It surrounded Pablo and his business. It had traveled all over Colombia not long before in the form of civil war, and finally, it was still around. Guerrilla groups all over Colombia were engaged in all-out hostilities. So the storming of the Palace of Justice and Escobar's subsequent open conflict with the government didn't seem like something that appeared out of nowhere. It wasn't as if everything was quiet and peaceful and then Pablo suddenly raided the main judicial body of the country. There were fights with the authorities before him and parallel to him and after him. The other conversation is that he had more money than any guerrilla group in Colombia, which means that the punch he could strike with was several orders of magnitude stronger. However, the echoes of these punches that Escobar was striking at the authorities, and especially the strongest at the time in the form of the Palace of Justice takeover, were reaching his organization as well. After the Palace of Justice ordeal, those shareholders of the Medellin cartel who had refused to participate in the fight against extradition started leaving the cocaine business altogether, believing that it was becoming too dangerous and all was not smooth sailing at the top of the cartel. Letter by that time was broke, in fact, and was number one among the dealers to be extradited. Gotcha, 
had lost more than half of his capital from the police raid on Tranquinlandia, and Jorge Ochoa sat in a Spanish prison waiting to see where he would end up, Colombia or the United States. You could tell the Medellin cartel was starting to fall apart. Escobar was also having business issues, but of all the cartel leaders, he was the strongest on his feet. Yes, his shipments through Panama, Jamaica, and the Bahamas were increasingly intercepted by the DEA, but he found new routes and began moving cocaine through Mexico. It could be said that his war with the government, while challenging, had little effect on the way things were done. The only thing that had changed was Pablo's daily lifestyle. There was no longer the luxurious hacienda of Naples, nor was it possible to move about the street or go to public places without fear. Although the ordinary residents were still on his side and would not think of turning him into the police, outings had to be well prepared. As I said before, during the day he traveled in the trunk of a car, and if Pablo wanted to visit a restaurant or a nightclub, cartel members, most often women, would go there first. They had to stay for a while, making sure there were no cops in the place, and only then the driver brought Pablo out. When Escobar arrived at the club, the owners were immediately notified, and they in turn warned security that any suspicious persons who tried to get into the establishment should be instantly reported to Pablo's guards. Thanks to these and other precautions and the loyalty of the people of Medellin, Escobar was like a ghost whose presence the police felt but could not see or catch. After taking over the Palace of Justice, where the evidence against Escobar got destroyed, he continued to increase pressure on the authorities because his priority had not yet been achieved, and extradition was still a threat. Sure, there was a brief period when extradition got suspended, but everyone realized it was due to bureaucratic delays, and it was only a matter of time before extradition came back. Oh, and the mere fact that extradition was canceled meant nothing. Pablo needed a peace treaty on his terms. Therefore, Escobar's sicarios literally began to threaten everyone who had the courage to speak out against the cartel or in favor of extradition. If the threats didn't work, people were killed. Politicians, judges, police officers, journalists, everyone was in the crossfires. Here is what one of the judges who resigned after numerous threats said. A year ago, every lawyer dreamed of a post as a judge, but now everyone is hiding as long as he is not offered a post. To give you an idea of the scale of all this terror, in 1986 in Medellin alone, there were 3,500 murders, 80% of them involving firearms. That's about one murder every two hours. Police officers accounted for most of the victims while judges and politicians were killed for their decisions or statements, and journalists for their stories. Police officers were getting killed wholesale, if I might say. And it all started with the fact that when President Betancourt first gave broad powers to the police to search premises and arrest those connected with the cartel, and then President Barco, who succeeded him, put a $10 million bounty on Pablo's head, unscrupulous law enforcers decided to cash in on it. They broke into the homes of those allegedly connected to the cartel and during the search could beat up the owner and profit off the property in the house. They even went so far to say that a portrait of Pablo hanging on the wall could be grounds for a search or arrest. And if their connection to the cartel was even more obvious, the person was kidnapped and tortured to find out where Escobar was. At first, there was no particular response to these actions from Pablo. Sicarios killed police officers in chaotic confrontations and nothing more. The trigger for an open confrontation was the torture and further murders of Pablo's cousin, Hernando Gaviria, and his trustee, Diego Mapas. After the incident, Escobar announced that he would pay anyone who killed a police officer. For the lowest rank and position, he promised at least $1,500,000. Killing police turned into a real blood business for the poor people of Medellin, and the corpses of cops began to show up on the streets almost every day. The problem was that decent police officers who had nothing to do with the lawlessness going on were lumped in as well. Throughout 1986, despite the constant killings and the very real terror, Pablo Escobar spent most of his time in Medellin and thereabout. 
His well-established guerrilla system and the loyalty of the population allowed him to always be one step ahead of the police. But with each passing month, the situation grew more tense and the authorities' patience was running out. The turning point was the murder of Guillermo Cano Isaza, editor-in-chief of the newspaper El Espectador, who had been the first to publish Escobar's first arrest and had since continued to denounce drug traffickers. By then, society was on edge, and the murder of Cano Isaza caused as much outrage as the death of Laura Bonilla, and President Barco, like President Betancur before him, issued a series of decrees declaring a state of siege in the country. The police were once again given unlimited powers, which meant that even with all precautions, it was impossible to stay in Medellin. Pablo Escobar said goodbye to his family and went on the run, where he would remain until a surrender in 1991. The one thing that was constant in Escobar's escape was his changing locations. He never stayed in the same home or safe house for long. Everything else was constantly shifting. He lived in one of his luxurious villas scattered throughout Colombia, or he lived in a small house for sheltered people. Then he was eating like a king and sleeping on silk sheets. Later, he was running through the jungle in the rain from a pursuing army. I will not detail all the events that happened to Escobar then, but instead suggest listening to the stories of his brother, Roberto Gaviria, who was at Pablo's side during that period. They best illustrate how Escobar lived before La Catedral. Most of the time we lived on farms owned by Pablo, less often deep in the jungle. Only our closest friends knew where we were. When Pablo needed to see someone, a lawyer, a politician, or a friend, that person was brought to him blindfolded. Even our own mother didn't know where we were. Safety always came first. Pablo always bought farms on roads many miles from our home and put his men there. If necessary, he built houses for them. When enemy forces passed that place day or night, we were immediately notified to get ready to leave. One of the radios that Pablo had distributed to all of our neighbors buzzed around 6 a.m. in the morning. Called by one of the residents of a neighboring farm named Jose Posada, he shouted into the radio, The police are already here. We saw trucks and heard helicopters. Run! A few seconds later, we really did hear helicopters approaching. Damn mosquitoes, Pablo swore at them. As they got closer, they started firing from the air. We ran, shooting back as much as we could. Some of us ran to the river, others into the woods before we even got dressed. Pablo was in his nightclothes without a shirt or shoes. Fortunately, Pablo had planted some spiny trees and bushes that made it impossible for the helicopters to land, but they kept shooting at us from the air. Bullets hit the ground and trees and whistled over our heads. I ran faster than I had ever run in training. After the 30-day walk, some of us were very sick with coughs and fevers. My own fever was terrible and I didn't even know where I was. They took me to the hospital under an alias. For three days, I was unconscious. They gave me cold showers to cool me down. Sometimes I woke up screaming, demanding to see Pablo. Fortunately, no one knew that the Pablo I called was the most wanted man in the world. Pablo was sick, but stayed on the farm. For security, he hired a gang from Medellin to guard the men while they recovered. There were such strong feelings about being disconnected from the rest of the world and powerless to change our situation. We got news from the TV or during phone calls with our families. Our relatives read us newspapers that sometimes reported where the government thought we were staying or where we were wanted. Every day, every minute, our lives were on the line. Every time we heard an airplane approaching, we stopped and waited. We lived our lives ready to move at all times. One night I will never forget in my whole life was December the 1st, 1990, Pablo's birthday. We were staying in a nice house and we had Otto and El Gordo as bodyguards with us. It was nice to settle down after all we had been through. It was a few days when we were free and happy. At breakfast, everyone was saying happy birthday to Pablo. He was happy that day, feeling confident that the government would soon be ready to make a deal. At breakfast, he said, I'm having a party tonight, and I'm inviting an orchestra. I want live music. Surely, I thought he was joking. 
bringing musicians into the house would be impossible. As soon as they left, the first thing they would do would be to call the cops and collect the reward. The police, on the other hand, weren't interested in putting us in jail. They wanted us dead. I was concerned. With all due respect, Pablo, I asked, how are you going to bring the band in? Pablo smiled. Don't worry about it. Just trust me. Everything will be fine. In the evening, while in my room, I heard everyone laughing and having fun. I immediately went downstairs with my suitcase and saw six musicians playing guitars. They were all blindfolded. They couldn't know who they were playing for. I didn't know whether to laugh, be sad, or angry. But it was Pablo. Everyone was ecstatic, and no one thought Pablo was capable of such a thing. It was so poignant. For dinner, he ordered all kinds of seafood, lobster, and octopus, and four bottles of Portuguese port wine. He invited the musicians to join us and was very happy to share his birthday with the band. Escobar's life, as you've realized, was not sweet and sugar. He was constantly on the verge of death, and moments of joy were just a drop in the ocean. Weekdays were a constant strain. In addition, during the same period, he would lose two of his cartel mates. Letter was caught and sent to an American prison, and Gotcha was killed in a shootout with the police. To make matters worse, Escobar had to fight not only the authorities, but also Colombia's second largest drug cartel, Cali. Around the same time that President Barco declared a state of siege, Pablo was targeted. A bomb exploded outside his home called Monaco. His wife and children were unharmed, and Escobar himself was not at home at the time. There had been clashes between the two cartels before, but mostly they were spontaneous and quickly resolved. This was the first attempt on the boss's life. At first, people in Pablo's crew thought it was the cops, but Escobar was sure that it was the work of Cali. They had long been fighting him for spheres of influence in New York, and seeing that the Medellin cartel was bruised on all sides, decided that now was the time to strike. Pablo's theory was soon confirmed. His men found out who was responsible for the bomb that blew up near Monaco. It turned out to be a guy from Spain who the Calenos had brought to Colombia to eliminate Escobar. He was now in a Spanish prison with one of Pablo's men. This man contacted the bomber and invited him to a meeting with Escobar. At the meeting, Pablo asked if he wanted to get into the business of smuggling cocaine to Spain. And when he agreed, he said he was willing to give him the first shipment for free, but he had to teach Escobar's men how to make bombs. The guy had almost no choice. He confirmed that his first bomb in Colombia was aimed at Escobar's family, so understandably, he agreed to teach the cartel's men. In addition to the Spanish bomber, the cartel members were also trained by British and Israeli mercenaries who taught the Sicarios the finer points of combat. From a collection of poor kids in Medellin, Escobar's Sicarios turned into trained killers and bombers. So there is no reason to think that Pablo's war against the state was a simple confrontation of locals against trained soldiers. Escobar responded to the bombing near the Monaco by first carrying out a series of his attempts on Cali cartel men and then bombing pharmacies owned by Cali bosses. According to the Colombian army, by 1988, just over 80 people had been killed in the cartel war, 60 of which were with Cali. Although Escobar got distracted by competitors and decided to take out his rivals, the main front line was still his conflict with the state. That's where all forces were thrown. And the next high-profile event in this confrontation was the assassination of presidential candidate Luis Carlos Galan, a zealous advocate of extradition. Even though 18 years after the murder, Galan's election rival, Alberto Santofimio, was convicted for ordering the hit, it was clear to everyone that the Medellin cartel had played a hand in it. This death expectedly led to the imposition of a state of siege. The government seized nearly a thousand properties and ranches, 700 cars and trucks, over 350 airplanes, 73 boats, and nearly five tons of cocaine. The government claimed rights to four farms owned by Gacha the Mexican, as well as some of Pablo's properties and businesses in Medellin. President Barco also brought the extradition treaty with the United States back into effect. The cartel responded by saying that it would kill 10 judges for every person extradited. Immediately, 
More than 100 judges resigned their positions. Medellin began to fight even more fiercely than before. In the first few days, 17 bombs were detonated in banks, stores, and even political party offices. The United States offered to send in troops at the first request of the Colombian government. In response, the cartel fired a homemade rocket at the U.S. Embassy in Colombia. The missile did not explode, but the implication was clear. In coordination with local authorities, special U.S. intelligence units with the latest wiretapping equipment were sent to assist the Colombian police and army. The Colombian army itself created a special search unit exclusively engaged in capturing Pablo Escobar. To fight back against the search unit, a so-called bombing campaign was launched. There were over a hundred bombings, judges were bombed, newspapers that wrote in favor of extradition were bombed, every police officer was targeted. Medellin's police stopped living in their own homes to protect their families and stayed together in safe houses. Everyone in the city, and perhaps in the countryside too, was affected in one way or another by the bombing campaign. But seeing that all the terrorist attacks, murders and intimidation had failed to produce the desired effect of a peace treaty on the cartel's terms, Pablo seemed to have decided that it was not the petty judges and policemen that needed to be killed, but those at the very top, those personally responsible for his capture and advocating for extradition. So first, he put a man with a bomb on board the plane, which Cesar Gaviria, the man who replaced Gallen in the election race and continued his ideas, was to fly. The plane exploded in the air, but Gaviria was not there. The future president had changed plans. Then Escobar made an attempt to kill the head of the DAS, Miguel Maza Marquez, a man who acted tougher and more effectively than the others in the hunt for Escobar. Pablo's men packed a van with explosives weighing about 1,100 pounds and aimed it at the DAS building where Marquez was located. The plan was for the van to drive into the lobby and explode, but something went wrong and the explosion happened outside the building instead. It was so strong that the facade of the building collapsed, the motor of the minibus was found several blocks away, and houses within 20 blocks of the epicenter suffered damage. Around 50 people died, and about a thousand were injured. Marquez, however, managed to survive. Along with the bombings and assassination attempts, Escobar began kidnapping relatives of Colombia's elite, people who either influenced the country's politics or were very closely connected with the government. Pablo's main captive was a famous journalist and a daughter of a former Colombian president, Diana Turbe. And the kidnappings bore fruit. Under pressure from the High Society of Colombia, Cesar Gaviria, having already become president, agreed to make concessions and promised that the voluntarily surrendered drug lords would be sentenced in their home country and would serve their time there. This offer was immediately taken advantage of by those drug traffickers who were tired of the war and wanted to retire from the business. The Ochoa brothers were among the first of them. Of those who had been at the top of the Medellin cartel since its inception, only Pablo Escobar remained, and he was dissatisfied with the offer. He realized first that to the U.S., his name was the embodiment of illegal drugs, and that they would try to put him in their prisons while he was still able to breathe. Secondly, he had killed so many law enforcement officers that life in a regular prison would be hell at best, and at worst, he wouldn't make it there a day. And third, in addition to the threat of the police, there was also a threat from the Cali cartel, which, with their money and connections, could easily carry out a hit on Escobar in prison. So Pablo continued to negotiate with the government. At the same time, he was still holding relatives captive, setting off bombs all over Colombia and waging war with the police. For every refusal to agree to Pablo's terms, a series of terrorist attacks and murders followed. Colombia was choking on blood. The only people who still supported Escobar were Medellin's poor. All that everyone else wanted was for the violence in the streets to finally stop. A wave of resentment rose from the grassroots and hit President Cesar Gaviria with full force when Diana Turbe was killed by police in a shootout during a raid on a hostage's house. The elites began to pressure Gaviria with renewed vigor, and he was eventually forced to agree to Escobar's terms. 
Under agreement with the government, the authorities were required by law to cancel the extradition. Maza Marquez was to be removed from his position as DAS chief, and the drug traffickers could be charged with only one account, which they themselves would surrender to. Pablo retained the right to all previously acquired property, and most importantly, he would serve his sentence in a prison he had built himself. The only thing that overshadowed this undoubted victory was the murder of Pablo's right-hand man and best friend, Gustavo Gaviria, by a search unit. Otherwise, life seemed to be settling down and everything seemed to be going according to plan. The business continued to bring in huge amounts of money. The main battle was won, and after five years coming out of his own prison, Pablo Escobar was completely clean before the law. But as time showed, it was the battle that had been won, but the war was not even close to ending. Escobar's surrender stopped the violence in the streets, but it did not stop the flow of cocaine into America. His organization was run by trusted men, and new business people took the place of those who had gone out of business during the strife with authorities. Pablo was still the biggest player in the field, and before he sat in La Catedral, he made an agreement not only with the state, but also with the other metal and dealers. He established a tax to be paid by other drug traffickers to him for serving time for them all, and his battle with the authorities led to them revoking extradition. Even here, he benefited. The prison Escobar built, however, was more of a protective fortress than a place to serve his sentence. It was called La Cathedral, meaning the cathedral, and was located on top of a hill hidden by fog in the mornings and evenings and surrounded by trees that, by an agreement with the government, no one could cut down. There was a high fence with barbed wire around the perimeter connected to 10,000 volts of electricity, and all the guards inside the prison were hired with Escobar's approval. All others, including the army and police, were not allowed to even go near La Cathedral. Later, weapons and money for Pablo and his men would also be brought into the prison and were kept in special caches made during its construction. The Sicarios used walkie-talkies to communicate inside the prison and cell phones and pagers to communicate with the outside world. All of these security measures went in place in the first couple of weeks. All that remained was to deal with the domestic side of things. For this, a man was hired and authorized to deliver food to the prison. His truck, which no one checked, was used to bring everything needed to La Cathedral. They brought jacuzzis and hot tubs, sound systems and televisions, computers and building materials, which they used to improve the rooms and even built themselves a bar. The same method was used to bring in cooks, who were hired to prepare meals for Escobar and his crew. La Cathedral eventually became not just a protective fortress, but quite a comfortable hotel. Even in prison, Pablo lived better than most Colombians. Also on this truck, which Escobar called a tunnel, Various people who wanted to see Pablo could get in. These were girls invited to parties, politicians, and various celebrities. Even entire soccer teams had played friendly matches with Escobar's men right on the grounds of the prison. Rumor has it that even Maradona attended a reception at La Cathedral. At this time, outside the prison walls, an era of peace began throughout Colombia. Yes, guerrilla groups occasionally organized some sort of raid, but it was incomparable to the constant bombings and murders performed by Escobar's sicarios. President Cesar Gaviria was happy with the situation, but the United States and the Cali cartel were not. For the former, Pablo's imprisonment had no effect on the amount of coke being imported, but for the latter, Escobar was a direct threat and their main competitor, preventing the cocaine business from developing on a large scale. Gaviria started to get pressured again, the Caleños, through their sources, provided the Minister of Defense with information on how exactly Pablo was living in his prison. The minister passed it on to the president, but Gaviria decided he was willing to pay such a price for peace in the streets and ignored the message. This information was kept from the public domain, which could not be said for the others. In Escobar's organization worked two partners by the name of Mancada and Galano. They had been working since the dawn of the Medellin cartel, and while Pablo was in prison, they ran his business. And it so happened that on their land was found a cache of money equivalent to the amount of cocaine they said they had seized in the last shipment. To get to the bottom of the matter, 
Escobar brought them to La Cathedral. After a lengthy conversation, Pablo did not believe their excuses, and Moncada and Galano were both killed in the prison grounds. This time, information about the incident did not go to the Minister of Defense or the President, but was leaked to the newspapers. Some say it was leaked by the Cali cartel, others by the DEA. That's not really important. What is was the fact that Escobar's actions were a spit in the president's face. And Gaviria mobilized the army to move Pablo and all of his men to another prison under the pretext of investigating the murders of Moncada and Galano. When soldiers surrounded La Cathedral and President Gaviria refused to discuss the decision, rejecting any prospect for negotiation, Escobar realized that he was left with two options, either flee or surrender. The second would most likely lead to either death or extradition, so he chose the first option, and along with his men, left La Cathedral a few hours before it was stormed. Having made his escape, Pablo hoped that he would again be able to negotiate with Gaviria, but the president did not negotiate, and in his public speeches gave only a guarantee that the surrender would ensure Escobar's safety and his life would not be threatened. That is, he was almost explicitly stating that if Pablo surrendered, there was no guarantee that he would not be extradited. Beyond the public eye, however, the president's agenda was very clear. When Escobar was found, his death in a shootout with the authorities would be considered a satisfactory outcome. The hunt for Pablo was on. To summarize what happened from the time of Escobar's escape until his death, it could be said that all the violence he had unleashed on society in his war with police came back to him times two. In addition to the search block, the DEA and the police, he was now being hunted by the U.S. sent Delta Force Special Operations Unit, as well as the Cali cartel-sponsored Los Pepes paramilitary group. It even got to the point that individual bounty hunters went to Colombia, whose only goal was to get a bounty on Pablo Escobar's head. But the most brutal, and therefore most effective, were the Los Pepes units. They were led by the Castaño brothers, leaders of the far-right guerrillas. Los Pepes unofficially cooperated and shared intel with the DEA, police, and the search units. It was safe to say that the Castaño brothers were doing everything the Escobar-hating police and military wanted to do themselves but could not. Getting tips either from the authorities or from people who had defected from Pablo, Los Pepes, in the tradition of the La Violencia War, killed anyone who had any connection to Escobar. The mere fact that you touched Pablo Escobar could be grounds for your murder. Everything Escobar did, he got back twofold. Did he make people afraid to join the police force or become judges? Now, people were afraid not only to work for Pablo, but even to admit they'd even shaken his hand. Did he put a bounty on killing cops, getting them murdered in the masses? Now, there was a bounty on his head, and its hunters were not exactly Medellin's poor. And the list goes on and on. Los Pepes, in cooperation with the authorities, were tearing Pablo's organization apart in Medellin with their terror. At the same time, the Cali cartel was successfully gaining markets in the United States. Pablo was cornered. He was simultaneously attacked by so many enemies that he could not calculate correctly, and as a result of several blunders, he found himself in a stalemate. His army had turned into a few reliable sicarios, a multi-billion dollar empire into a few dozen hiding spots, and luxury estates into modest metal and apartments that had to be constantly changed. Nevertheless, Escobar saw a way out of this situation too. He still had the support of the vast majority of Medellin's lower class and wanted to capitalize on that. Pablo worked to create a guerrilla force called Rebel Antioquia. His goal was to hide in the jungle, recruit new men, and hit his enemies with renewed strength. The only thing that kept him in Medellin was his family. His mother, wife, and children were not allowed out of the country so Escobar stayed in the city to negotiate a safe heaven where Los Pepes couldn't get them. Pablo constantly called the authorities to convince them to let his family out of the country, calling newspapers and radio stations to cover this disregard for civil rights. He tried threats, persuasion. He even offered the last of his money as a bribe. None of this worked, and Escobar made the decision that he needed to go into the forest as it was his only option. 
he needed to gain strength and find his family back from the clutches of his enemies. Unfortunately for Pablo and his loved ones, the decision was made too late. On the day he was scheduled to leave Medellin, Escobar answered questions over the phone about his family's situation for a German magazine using his son. He hoped that by doing so, he could appeal to the German government and his wife and kids would be allowed into Germany. The conversation was quite long. Forty questions had to be answered. It was this phone conversation that helped the search unit pinpoint Escobar's location. There are, however, several versions of what happened next. But whoever killed Pablo, Los Pepes, the search unit, or him putting a bullet into his own head, the fact remains that on December 2, 1993, Pablo Escobar's life ended on the roof of an ordinary Medellin home. The most controversial known criminal of our time, who earned the undivided love of his fellow Paisas and the deep-rooted hatred of the rest of Colombia. His funeral was attended by more than 10,000 people from Medellin.